All right. Sweet. There we go. All right. So we are officially live. We'll let some people trickle in while we share this here. And then uh, there it is. Cool. I'll try to tag you in it too, Doc. And yeah. See if that'll good. see if that'll work better. Oh, I see it. Yeah, I'll share it here. Okay, cool, cool. Let's see if that lets me do what I want to do. Awesome, there we go. Sweet. So we'll go ahead and share that with the Legendary Chiropractor page. And then we'll share it over to the group because everyone needs to see it. <laughs> That's my philosophy. The more the merrier. Right on. I'll share it to my page too. Awesome. Cool. Sweet. Yeah. It looks like we're getting some people trickling in here. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Chiropractic Compass podcast and Facebook lives. We are here. This is presented by the Legendary Chiropractor online community. I'm your host, Johnny Ruder, and we are here tonight with the incredible Dr. Tabor Smith, the spinal hygienist and Phenomenal, phenomenal chiropractor. So, Doc, I, uh, that's my brief introduction. Please share your accolades, share uh, your background, how you got it into chiropractic, and uh, sure. how you ended up where you're at now. Sure. Well, thanks for uh, letting me be on. I always appreciate being able to share the passion um, of chiropractic and really of, of what I call lifetime spinal care. Because if you just – and, and my, my buddy, buddy, good friend um, – Dan Sullivan, he always says, if you just take the word chiropractic out of it, you still, we have something extremely valuable. Like it doesn't change anything. If you take the word chiropractic out, you still have a spine and a nervous system that controls the function of the body and it's, and it's common sense. And we see it over and over in our practices, um, in real life that, um, people's lives are changed when their spine and nervous systems start functioning better. Um, and I was no different. I was a 16 year old, uh, kid trying to play basketball, trying to play sports. My dad was a high school basketball coach and, uh, I, I had, you know, repetitive injuries to my lower back and I had severe lower back pain that my parents had no idea about chiropractic. So we kept covering it up with over the counter medications until it got so bad that I couldn't even play. I started having these shooting pains that would go down my legs and we went to the medical doctor and they gave me stronger pain pills, mm -hmm. anti-inflammatories, muscle relaxers. I was, I was taking everything. Um, and again, we still didn't know about chiropractic. So it wasn't like I could go to a chiropractor then. Um, I, I remember waking up one night in the middle of the night in spasms, screaming. My parents coming in. We went, we went to the emergency room and did uh, imaging, x-rays. I'm not sure what all they did, but I left with stronger pain meds anti-inflammatories and more muscle relaxers basically. Um, and so we had some family members in our local town and they had had some really good results with the local chiropractor. And they said, you should take Tabor to the chiropractor. And, um, you know, my next step was they had given us a referral to a neurosurgeon. So I thought, no, let's try the chiropractor. I don't know what it is, but it sounds better than a surgeon. <laughs> um, and I uh, thank God that they did because it was life changing. They they took x-rays of my lower back. They showed me an area in my lumbar spine that was shifted so far out of alignment. It was uh, crushing the nerves. It caused a stress fracture in my lower back, a spondylitic spondylolisthesis. Um, I didn't know that at the at the time, but I learned <laughs> that at chiropractic school. That's what I have. Um, but the chiropractor said, look, people with your exact problem have gotten better in my office and um we do that through chiropractic adjustments and i think i can help you and i remember i was like let's do it i started going to the chiropractor every other morning before school to get adjusted mm. and it, he was right and it didn't go away overnight it wasn't a, a you know some magic fix but within two or three months i was completely restored healthy played basketball my senior year played basketball in college um, never would have got to do some of the things I got to do unless it was for chiropractic. And that's when I decided that's what I wanted to be awesome. was a chiropractor. Awesome. What a great story. That's I, I love hearing people's chiropractic stories because they're all – they're so different but they're kind of the same. You know, We all end up at this end goal of becoming a chiropractor or wanting to become a chiropractor and actually doing it. Um, right. And that's really cool. I love your story. I love the, the chiropractic message. I, I want to touch on one thing that you said that I actually jotted down right away. And I was like, because a lot of people share their story and they're like, yeah, we got told by someone else to go see a chiropractor. How important is word of mouth, right, about chiropractic? And what do you think word of mouth today in today's society is 
about chiropractic, positive or negative? Well, I think it's becoming a lot more positive. I think, I think every one of us, the, the one thing that we need in chiropractic more than anything else, the one thing our, our society needs is awareness mm. that you need to take care of the spine and nervous system. Um, you know, dentistry has done a great job of creating an awareness that we should take care of our teeth. And it wasn't always like that. I, I tell a story back in the early 1900s. Um, people didn't brush every day. They didn't floss. And in fact, because right in that time period was when processed foods started coming into our diet and, and sugars. And so the teeth began to rot at earlier and earlier ages. And if, and if you look back in the history books, you can see dentists in the early 1900s were very busy pulling teeth, so busy pulling teeth, they couldn't do anything else in their office. And, uh, and it wasn't until they started sharing this this information, this dental hygiene that you need to start brushing, you need to start taking care of it. Your dental health matters. You can prevent tooth decay. And that took a while to actually spread, but now it's a household term. Everybody takes care of their teeth. Everybody has a dentist. And I believe that's what we need to do as chiropractors is we've got to get this awareness out there to a point where people are like, okay, I need to be doing something to take care of my spine. And right now I think is, is the best time we've ever had to share this message because just like in the early 1900s when, you know, processed foods and sugars were causing tooth decay. Now in our day and age, video games, cell phones, technology, all of these things, sitting, sedentary lifestyle, that's causing spinal decay at greater rates than ever before. I can throw out some statistics. You know, it's hard for us to know exactly like what percentage of a population has something, especially something like spinal degeneration, which is what we call a silent epidemic. Nobody even knows they have it until it's too late usually. Um, but we can look at certain studies and there was one, let's see here, I have the actual one that was done by the American Journal of Neuroradiology. Um, and it was put out November 27, 2014, and they, they showed that 96% of the 80-year-olds in their study had severe degenerative arthritis uh, and spinal degeneration. And then you look at the Chicago Institute of Neurosurgery. They showed in one of their studies that 85% of 50-year-olds have severe arthritis and degeneration of the spine or, or degenerative disc disease. And so, you know, when I'm talking about an 80-year-old or a 50-year-old, a lot of people are like, yeah, well – Arthritis is caused from old age anyway, you know, 50, 80, yeah, yeah maybe they're going to have spinal degeneration. But in today's day and age, it's younger and younger and younger. And we're looking at 20-year-olds yeah, that are having yeah. surgery after surgery because of spinal decay. In fact, in the same study, the American Journal of Neuroradiology showed that 37% of the 20-year-olds they looked at had severe degenerative disc disease. And 20 is not old. And then there was a, also a study done out of uh, researchers out of Scotland. It was published in the Back Letter, 2004. And it sh they, what they did was they took 154 10 year olds and they put them through an MRI. And they weren't even really looking at the spine per se, but what they did notice when they did look was that 9% of them had the beginning stages of spinal degeneration at the age of 10. And the, the researchers weren't even chiropractors, but what they said is that um, they would contribute that to sedentary lifestyles, you know, technology, like computers and video games and cell phones and those things that we're doing more and more, we're moving less, and spines are degenerating at earlier ages. And this is not, you know, something that, um, you know, we're just now discovering. In fact, the CDC said back in 2003, and this is a quote, actually, it says by 2020, that the expected number of people with OA or osteoarthritis will have doubled, right? Mm. And now they said that back in 2003. So they know that it's getting worse. Yeah. But the, the thing is, is medicine's never going to be motivated enough to implement something like spinal hygiene. Because I mean, think about it, like, what if we had a customer that didn't even know that they had something going on until like it was too late and now they're going to take my pill for the rest of their life or they're going to be, you know, um, next up for a hundred thousand dollar back surgery and ha actually have to have multiple back surgeries throughout their life because they started at such a young age. So I think if it's not, uh, if it's not us, uh, or physical therapy or, you know, somebody like us that implements spinal hygiene, I just, I, I think we're going to start seeing health decline at faster rates. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think the degenerative going on the degenerative measures, you know, a lot of people think exactly what you said, right? It's, it's older people, it's 80 year olds, it's 90 year olds. We're not thinking of the, the people with, you know, the idiopathic scoliosis causing degenerative changes to the spine or the people that are on tablets and phones and looking down sure. and all of these things contribute to decreased spinal curvatures to, um, degenerative changes that we can, 
in theory, in theory, prevent through chiropractic yeah. care, frequent chiropractic care, right? Well, yeah, I've been I've been practicing eleven years, and I'll tell you, it just in that amount of time, I'm seeing more degeneration at younger ages than I was when we, when we first started. And I have interviewed docs that have been practicing for 30 and 40 years, like for our uh, documentary we're, we're working on, and they say the exact same thing. More people at younger ages having spinal degeneration. And really what we look at, like, we know there's multiple causes of spinal degeneration, but we also know because of different studies that lack of motion causes adhesions, which calcify and causes decay of the joint. You can look at Tapio Vardaman. He did a, a famous study on rabbits. It wasn't a very nice study to the rabbits, but <laughs> he, he, cast, he would cast their joints, and then at different intervals of time, he would cut into the joint and see what was going on. So within, he said within 15 days, we develop adhesions, and then over time, those adhesions calcify and turn into bone spurs and degenerate the joint. And he, that was actually one of the big studies that now, you know, they don't cast an entire leg for nine months like they used to. They, they actually get that knee moving and start the exercise right after a surgery. Mm -hmm. So that was a big one. Uh, the other thing we've known for a long time is Wolf's Law. Um, when we have abnormal pressures in the bone, they, it remodels, and we know that causes bone spurring or calcifications as well. Um, and so we can define some of the reasons why we would have degeneration and alignment and range of motion. Two things, two components of the vertebral subluxation complex uh, uh, play a major role in degeneration of the spine, no doubt. Yeah, absolutely. And the degenerative changes aren't, I mean, let's talk about, you know, I, I want to talk, get back to the degenerative changes because I think it's an important topic, but I want to talk about a little bit about the communication between chiropractors and, and the public. How do we get this across to the lay person that doesn't understand maybe even chiropractic at all, but definitely doesn't understand degeneration, osteophytes, you know, sure. you know, osteophytic changes, et cetera. How do we get that across to people? So, so I think we take a page out of, out of a, a book of, of a different profession, dentistry, like we've been, that we mentioned earlier. And, and we look at what they did because people, if you ask someone why they brush their teeth, they might superficially tell you, well, I want good breath or I'd like to have white teeth. But ultimately, that is not the reason why the, we implemented dental hygiene. We implemented dental hygiene as a, as a mass you know, movement because of, of they're trying to prevent tooth decay. Um, and we know for a fact now that if you do practice regular dental hygiene, you, you're not going to have a perfect – you know, dental health bill, but you're going to have a uh, decrease your risk factors for cavities and degeneration and, and tooth decay, right? Yeah. Um, and so we, they have instilled that into our society so deeply that me as a parent, I took my kids to the dentist as soon as they had teeth, right? And, and you know what? It wasn't because they had a problem. They didn't have a pain. They didn't, I wasn't expecting them to find a cavity, but I just want my kids to have good dental health because I feel like it's important. Well, the question we have to ask us is, have we failed so far in implementing this for spinal health? Because as a parent, you know, I still want my kids to have good spinal health. And in fact, I believe that it's more important than having dental health. So it, we, dentists have done a, such a great job of ingraining that into our society that I actually look like a bad parent if I don't take my kids to the dentist when they're young. Why don't I look like a bad parent if I don't take my kids to the chiropractor when they're young? In fact, yeah. sometimes – that that's been opposite. Some people have actually said you're a bad parent if you take your kids to the chiropractor. <laughs> yeah. I think is absolutely crazy. <laughs> right? So yeah. it, it's just it's just taking that um, example, and we've seen that it's done, and we can do that. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that same thing in chiropractic as they've as they've done in dentistry. Um, you know, I, sh I shared just an interesting finding that we did. So um, I have a, a a big email list of chiropractors, and we would email this poll out to chiropractors. And we said, in, it was a simple one question, actually two question poll. And the first question was, do you practice uh, spinal hygiene? And then the second question was, if you do, what do you do, right? Um, and so the first question, 40% um, uh, of chiropractors said they practice spinal hygiene, all right, 40%. Of that 40% that said they practice spinal hygiene, they said there was, you know, answers all over the board for what they do. Some people say they stretch or they do yoga or they just get adjusted regularly, um, you know, which is fine. All those different answers, those are great answers. But it shows the 
the mindset we're in as, as a profession right now, because what if I would have emailed, you know, 10,000 dentists and asked them if they practice dental hygiene and if they do, what is it that they do? And I promise you that 99% of those dentists would have said, yes, I practice dental hygiene. And not only that, but like the answers would be very, very similar in what they do. Mm -hmm. And so dentistry has done a great job of organizing their information around how do you take care of your teeth, right? Yeah. And that's what we've tried to do as, you know, with the spinal hygiene movement is let's organize our information and let's teach people the most simplest, most effective ways to take care of their spine on a daily basis. That's important because brushing your teeth is, is a daily thing. Mm -hmm. Flossing is a daily thing. In fact, the dentist doesn't make any money of you brushing your teeth, but yet they teach you to brush, they teach you to floss every time you come in. In fact, they might make more money if you don't. I was just gonna, I was just gonna say that same thing. <laughs> they probably make right. more money if you don't do it. So why? So why do they waste their time teaching you to brush and floss? Because they know the mm -hmm. person who has that awareness that they should take care of their teeth, that they want a healthy teeth. That's their lifetime patient, right? And so they want to be the expert in dental health. So they teach us to brush. They teach teach us the floss. They give us free toothbrushes and flosses and they want everyone to take care of their teeth. And that's really, if we could adopt that as chiropractic, I can't believe we haven't yet. I really feel like it will explode chiropractic. Let me, let me give you some, some more statistics. So there's a Gallup poll where they, uh, they asked Americans, how, how many of you brush your teeth on a regular basis? 97% of Americans say they brush their teeth on a daily basis. And I can't believe it's actually not more than that, but 90, 97% of Americans brush their teeth. And then one of the questions was, how many, uh, how many people actually go to the dentist regularly for checkups? And that answer was 50%. 50% of Americans go to the dentist, right? But it took 97% of people brushing their teeth every day to get 50% of the people actually going to a dentist regularly. Yeah. Now, in that same Gallup poll, there were questions about chiropractic. And there, there was no question on how many people practice spinal hygiene because that doesn't even exist, right? So your answer would be tiny. And then they said, how many people visit a chiropractor on a regular basis? And they said 2.7%. Mm. of the population, mm. all right? So, but imagine this. What if 97% of Americans did one exercise every day to take care of their spine? That would explode this number of 2.7% yeah. yeah. because there would be an awareness that yeah. we should take care of our spine and that 2.7% would explode so drastically we wouldn't have enough chiropractors to take care of people, right? So we, in my opinion, if we really, really want to grow our profession, we adopt this concept of spinal hygiene. We teach people how to take care of their spine at home. It doesn't matter how old you are. We want to, we want to promote checkups. Um, we, we know that we, we talk about understanding the basics of spinal health, alignment, range of motion and strength. You know, we try to just keep it simple so that people can understand and what are they doing on a daily basis to promote good alignment, range of motion and strength. And what I've found in my office and my offices uh, that we've had um, is that the, the patients who understand that concept that have a greater awareness that they should take care of their spine and nervous system. Those are my lifetime patients. Yeah. Those are the ones who've been with me for, you know, a decade. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and those are the people that get it right. They get that big idea that BJ always talked about. They yeah. they understand chiropractic at a different level because yeah. they know if they go without it, that they, they their body suffers and they re start to recognize this this phenomena. That's like, oh my gosh, my joints are getting stiff. I'm I'm not as loose as I once was or as I should be. Um, I rolled my ankle. I rarely roll my ankles. Like these little things that we don't think tie into chiropractic they absolutely tie into chiropractic well and it's just like the the population they see that dental health is important and they see that dentistry is the vehicle to help them achieve that yeah. and what they need to see is that spinal health is important and that chiropractic is the vehicle to help them achieve that absolutely i love that i love i'm, I'm gonna write that down but i love that i love that because it's so important but now i want to i want to shift the conversation a little bit and kind of ask you a little a little question that says you know we talk about the awareness with dentistry we talk about the awareness with den dentists and saying like they understand the health they understand the body and and the teeth and the mouth and how important that hygiene is how hard do you think it is and how difficult do you think it is to unite <laughs> chiropractic and chiropractors mm -hmm. to come together on one solid front for this yeah. movement to actually take place. I think personally, that's pretty tough. How do you, how do you take that? So, so that's a great question. I think 
in in the realm of spinal hygiene, it's easier than trying to all agree on what subluxation is, yeah. right? Yeah. Because I don't know if a chiropractor, physical therapist, um, medical doctor, acupuncturist, I don't know of any practitioner that would say range of motion is not important in a joint, right? And so what yeah. we're saying is that spinal range of motion is important, that mm-hmm. it should be bilat- uh, that it should be symmetrical, mm-hmm. right? And, and within normal ranges. Um, I don't think there, there's a practitioner that would say that, you know, a certain amount of fitness in the muscle around the spine is important, right? And that abnormal balance along that spine is abnormal and should be corrected, right? Yeah. So we're saying range of motion, strength, those things are important. And really, there is not a physician that should disagree with alignment uh, either because you can look – just look at that poster right behind you. Uh, so uh, that was Leonardo da Vinci if I'm not mistaken or at least he did draw that um, at one point um, and he was one of the first ones to start studying cadavers. And so for – centuries we've understood that the spine should be straight from the front and have natural curves from the side now we may agree to disagree on ranges of Mm -hmm. normal range of motion but nobody no no physician would say scoliosis is a normal finding right (laughs) right right and so so to an extent alignment range of motion and strength of a spine is undebatable that somebody if if looking to improve the health of their spine Alignment, range of motion, and strength are three areas where we could address to improve that health, whether you're a chiropractor or not. And that's what we're saying in spinal hygiene is we're saying, you know, um, here are some simple and effective things that somebody could do to improve those three areas. And simple and effective is important. You know, if we really want this to spread, think about the toothbrush, how simple that is um, and how general that is. Like yeah. imagine if you – if, if it took an hour to brush your teeth every day, right? You probably wouldn't do it every day. And imagine if you had to have a prescription from a dentist to get a toothbrush, right? With nobody, it just wouldn't have went viral. It wouldn't have spread. People wouldn't have do it every day. That's why in a chiropractic office, I think corrective exercises are great. If you're, if you're trying to correct vertebral subluxation and the complex, then giving and prescribing corrective exercises is important. But when it comes to spinal hygiene, we don't need corrective uh, exercises. We need general exercises that everyone could do. And that's why we've chose the, what I could call the core four, which are very important, but also very simple and only take a minute or two to do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, I think that leads us into my next question and, and conversation is how can, for the docs out there watching this, how can they implement this into their office? And I know you have a full program built up and I, I love that. How do they yep. either get in touch with you to get materials or how do they start implementing it tomorrow, right? Sure. Um, so, so it starts with your patient education. Um, and uh, what one visit that's very important for us is what I call the day three. Um, day one is exam. Day two is report of findings. Day three is their first full visit. And when they get their home care kit or their spinal hygiene kit and they get their education on what they need to be doing every day um, – Doctors can go to – there's actually some free videos at spinalhygienedoctor.com uh, that they can opt in for for some of the training there. Um, I send my patients to homespinalcare.com, and uh, that's a website that we built that's not branded my office. It's branded Spinal Hygiene. There's no opt-in form, so any office can send their patients to homespinalcare.com uh, to be able to watch some of those videos and start that process of spinal um, spinal hygiene education in their practice. You can also start setting up some workshops, but I think it's important to do a, a bit of uh, at least one-on-one patient education. I mean, that's what dentists do. And we start, they start with that. They start with the patient education, then they move out into the community outreach, right? Yeah. And that's when we do uh, lunch and learns, we do events, we do uh, things in our community to try to share that awareness of spinal health with our community as well. Yeah. And, and I, I think you nailed it right on the nose there. Um, the fact that we, there are simple things that you have implemented through spinal hygiene.com through home spinal care.com, all of these different things that these are resources that chiropractors, chiropractic students can use. Um, I want to, I want to now ask you if you were to go back in time, I, I always ask my guests this cause I think it's, I think it's good to hear if you were to go back in time and put yourself back in the student's shoes, just graduating, just out of college or grad school, what would you do differently and why, if anything? So I think it's important 
um, number one, to find a, a practice that, um, that you want to, um, I don't want to say mimic, but, um, you know, use as an example when growing your office. And the only way you can do that is to go out and visit clinics. And I think that's really important. I know for me, I did that and it was very, very helpful. Um, and then if you're going to do an associate, make sure you do one in an office that is going to practice like you want to practice uh, or you think you want to practice, even if you change it later, you know. Yeah. Um, but getting that experience and actually seeing it done um, even if you're just shadowing for a day or two is, is priceless. Um, also taking advantage of all the free information that's given online. And I'll be the first to tell you, like when there's a lot of different types of trainings in chiropractic now and people who are great chiropractors are actually putting out some really cool training and 70% of their stuff is free. And the reason why they do that, it's marketing. You should do that with your patients as well. Yeah. You should be giving information and, and so it's it's free information, but it's also very useful. And I've learned more a lot of times from the free information that that these marketers or these practitioners give uh, than than even on their course. So I still think you should invest and in, and purchase the courses and you know do those things, but definitely utilize all their free information that's out there. And there's becoming more and more of that in chiropractic. Yeah, and I, I think that's to credit you know social media and just the, mm -hmm. the presence that social media has in the chiropractic community. And I mean, we'll you and I Facebook lives like this. Yeah, right? I was going to just say that you and I wouldn't be here without that, you know, without that spark, without those those first couple pioneers doing it and realizing the true benefits of it. Um, so with all that being said, Dr. Tabor is actually I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but you're you're a doc, you're a chiropractor in Houston, Texas. Um, mm -hmm. You you run a massive office, if I recall, and um, one of the biggest in the state, which is pretty cool. And I believe your wife is also a chiropractor. Is that correct? That's correct. Awesome. And your kids are, your Instagram is super cute. If you don't follow Dr. Tabor on yes, Instagram, I, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, I oh my gosh. Your show. trips to the gym are just like my favorite things to watch. It's so funny. It is so funny. But that's, awesome. that's, that's great. So now I want to circle back. Go full circle. Where did you, when were you, when did you sit in the mirror and you were like, this seems to be in front of chiropractors everywhere. When, yeah. when did you make that leap and that bound? Because I, I think I've seen it in recent yeah. years, obviously, but I'm not sure so, how long it was around prior to then before that's coming a very, public. very, very good question. And so I, okay. So after I had my epiphany with chiropractic that changed my life and I was like, I got to go to chiropractic school. Um, I realized like since I had that debilitating lower back and leg pain, I realized I never, ever want that to come back. Right. And I thought if I go to a chiropractor every week for the rest of my life, fine, I'll do that. Um, but there's also got to be something else because like just innately and common sensely, I thought like I'm going to go to the gym and exercise. I'm going to strengthen back muscles. I was like, I don't know what I got to do, but I have to do it for the rest of my life. Yeah. Right. Because I never yeah. want to be back into that picture again where I'm just debilitated. It was horrible. Um, and so that turned into a quest and, the, and it turned into understanding like, wow, this is spinal hygiene. This is like common sense. Take care of your spine. Do this on a, on a regular basis, just like you brush your teeth and you'll have a healthier spine. Um, and so as soon as I opened my doors, I started teaching spinal hygiene and, and to my patients. And I started seeing like all of a sudden light bulbs come up and patients looking at you and saying, why haven't I heard this before? Like, and, and coming in and being like, you know, or, or they went through a corrective care plan and let's say they didn't start a wellness plan, but yet they came back a couple of years later and said, like, your exercises have been changing my life. I want to get back started again. And, you know, so it, it built an awareness, whether they were in my office or not, that taking care of their spine was important. And I saw that and I, and, and inside I'm always questioning, well, why our chiropractors not teaching this. I, I just don't get it. But we all kind of have that inner self doubt. And we're thinking like, if it's such a great idea, somebody would have thought about it and somebody would have done it. Right. So yeah. you tell yourself over and over when, even though you feel like you have this idea, this innate thought flash, like you need to, you need to share it with more people. You kind of just like, you hold back because you're like, who am I to have a really great idea? Right, you know? Right. And, uh, and so it's at one point I just, I, I learned a lot. I have a good mentor, a friend of mine, I think was on your show as well, Chris Zeno. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and just growing as a person, I thought I built up that confidence and I thought, no, this, this, this is an idea that should have already 
set sail. It should be a pillar of, of chiropractic in my opinion. Um, but we have to do everything that we can to get this out to more people because seeing a thousand people in my town of, you know, um, 7 million, uh, Houston, right. Yeah. Um, uh, is nothing. And right. it's a, it's a drop in the bucket and, uh, we, we have to share it with more people. And a great way to do that is to be able to share it with my, uh, colleagues and then have them share it with their patients and be able to get that out. And hopefully now even, um, in a, a movie, we're trying very hard to get uh, a documentary on Netflix to share the importance of spinal health and how it's changing people's lives when we use chiropractic um, and when we actually remove pressure from a nerve and correct subluxation and the body thrives. It was designed to be healthy and to get that message. It's all one message in my mind. It's like it, 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 subluxation happens when we don't take care of ourselves properly or when yeah. we're overstressed. And, um, you know, thank God chiropractors there to adjust that. But also they're there to teach us how to maintain and keep that healthy spine and nervous system, too. Right. Right. And uh, before I, I, I love all those points. Um Dr. Tabor, actually, before we came on the show, uh, we were on a Skype call, and that's how we stream this. Um, and you were talking about you just remodeled your office, and you said, "Sure." You said it's the perfect flow. So, yeah. as a spinal hygienist, as a spinal hygiene advocate for mm -hmm. your patients, and this might be part of your seminar. I'm not sure how much de how many details you can give away, but. What does the patient flow look like when they come in? How long are they exercising? Are they exercising in your office? What does yeah, that look like? So, so great point. So they do corrective care in my office. And I think that's where chiropractic shines is we're correcting vertebral subluxation, which has the adjustment component, the um, exercise, the traction component. So we're, we're doing corrective care in my office. But when they leave my office and they go home, they're doing spinal hygiene. And, um, and so I've been practicing 11 years and for about, well, since just recently, 10 years of them, um, we practice in a, an office that wasn't perfect, right? But uh, last year we did, it, at the end of last year, we did a complete remodel. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but basically we have a huge um, uh, adjusting area or adjustatorium back here behind that wall there, behind that TV. We have the hot seat area where we do workshops. Um, over here on this side is our corrective care uh, facility. So, so people come in, it's all wide open. There's no hallways. Um, they sit in the hot seats and wobble, get adjusted. Uh, they go over to the corrective care area where they'll have some curve traction, vibration plates, um, corrective strengthening exercises. We do reverse posture exercises. And so that's prescriptive. Okay. So I'm a doctor. I write the prescription for the corrective care that they need in my office. You need this many adjustments. You need this reverse posture exercise and you need, you know, to be doing these things in my office. But when you go home, this is your spinal hygiene kit. In fact, I think I have one right here. Um, they look like this right here and they, they get this. And so they're doing, they're doing their range of motion in the morning. They're doing their spinal molding in the evening, and they're doing their wobble disc and resistance band exercises um, during the day. So they have a, a sheet with four core four exercises, range of motion in the morning, spinal molding in the evening, just like they brush their teeth. Yeah. And then they're doing a reverse posture, uh, their exercise band, and a wobble disc to prevent the two most degenerative uh, joints in the spine, which is C5 and L5, right? Because the most degenerative posture is head forward posture. Yeah. So we're battling that. Um, and sedentary lifestyle causes degeneration or lack of, uh, or loss of disc height at L5. So we're getting the wobble disc and we're getting motion and movement in that disc. And those are the things we're talking about in our seminar. We're going to dive deep into why we chose each one of these core four. Because there's a lot of different studies out there. One of the studies I remember on compliance, right, getting your patients to do the home care, is they, they actually took two groups. One group, they or both groups, they gave the exact same home exercises, but one group, they, they taught them why they should do the exercises. The other group, they didn't teach them why. The group where they taught them why was 60% more compliant. <laughs> So if you teach a patient why they need to be doing it, you need to be doing a range of motion exercise every day because when I adjust you, we're increasing your range of motion. A healthy spine has a full range of motion. I need you to do that range of motion side every morning so that you can keep the range of motion that I'm giving you with these adjustments. Yeah. And then, you know, the curves of the spine are so important. Cervical curve, lumbar curve, we're correcting those curves every time I give you an adjustment, every time you're on a uh, traction. But every day at home, I need you laying on your spinal molding rolls in the evening to maintain and mold those curves back into place because of all the stress you put on them during the day, right? Yeah, yeah. And then 
Yeah. So it's like each exercise will explain to them why you do that exercise. And, and a lot of times that will spread through their family because they're like, well, can my husband do these exercises? And absolutely. That's why we use general exercises for spinal hygiene, not prescriptive because everybody sh- who had, who should have a straight spine from the front and natural curves from the side, everybody should be doing these exercises. Right. Yeah. And it keeps it simple because that's, I mean, you, you get the patient education in the office. You're able to explain why these pit, why they need to do it, why it's healthy for them and their spine and, and their, and you know, all of the preventative measures that you're taking on degeneration, but also it's, it's easy to do at home. And we yes. always struggle like chiropractors, I know are notorious for giving like 16 different exercises to people and they're like, strengthen your core, do shoulder oh. exercises, you know, yeah. flex your neck back and forth. It's like, right. what, what like, are we I doing? I need you to log into this giant, like, <laughs> you know, membership thing and do three hours of exercise every day. Don't do the wrong one or you're right. going to screw everything up. <laughs> You know, like we'll start uh, back in square one. <laughs> yeah, no wonder there's no compliance there. They, they, they've got to be simple and effective and, you know, they need to understand why they need to be doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that takes me into, uh, this, this kind of last question, um, is lifetime care. Uh, we get this all the time, especially as students, you know, we're, we're out trying to at life university, we get our own patients for outpatient clinic. And so we have to, you, you know, hand your business cards out, talk chiropractic, educate patients before their patients and educate them to come in the door. And a lot of question, the number one question I'd say that I get and my friends get is, do I have to see you all the time every day or all every week for the rest of my life? Do you have a good answer for that? And I'd love to hear it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, so I, again, I use the dental analogy, like, you know, you, I don't want you to have to come every day for the rest of your life. I want to be able to, you know, get you to where you're only coming for checkups, but it depends on what you're doing at home. Are you brushing your teeth and flossing and then going for that dental checkup on the frequency that that dentist tells you, right? Um, and once you get to that big, like for it, for example, once at one point I wasn't flossing. All right. And so when I did go to the dentist, they were like, look, you got to come back every month. In fact, we're going to put you on every three weeks and we're going to do teeth cleanings every three weeks until we get your gums where they need to be. And then you're going to, if you do floss every day, we can go back to like every three months and then every six months. And I finally got back on that every six months. Right. And so it was like, but I still go every six months and I still have a dentist because oral health is important for me. And so if spinal health is important, which it absolutely should be for everyone, then, then I want to be your chiropractor for the rest of your life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and help you and work with you to keep your spine healthy and well. And that will in turn keep your body healthy and well and you'll live a better life. It's a better way to live. Yeah. And you do a lot of, you do a lot of, uh, dinner with docs, at least that I see from your Facebook. Yeah. Do you, do you think, I think that communication component of, of education, patient education starts before they're even a patient. It starts before they even come in your door and they recognize what you do. It starts before they're a patient and it continues the entire time they are in your office. In fact, like a lot of docs, I've heard them say they only invite, they only let their patients come to the dinner if they bring uh, a friend or yeah. if that's not a patient, right? Yeah. That's their ticket to the dinner. Not for us, man. I will invite every patient to every dinner as many times as you want to come. In fact, I will encourage them to come because the, the people who come to their dinner and get just re, I don't know, dipped in the chiropractic understanding and philosophy – they're the ones that will continue to be there because they know why. Again, that compliance. They understand mm-hmm. why we're doing what we're doing. And so at the first Monday of every month, we've been doing it for over 10 years now in my practice. And we have patients that come every single month. Yeah. And I'm gladly buying their dinner. They're, it's it's well worth it for me and it's well worth it for them. Right, right. I, I don't I don't think uh, – I think it's solidified at one point, but I think that they become fans of the chiropractor – Right. And they, and they invest into you. They invest into your practice. They invest into your family. And I think that's really important to Uh, have some lifetime patients, right? Yeah. 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 They become your family. Yeah. Absolutely. So Dr. Tabor Smith, any closing regards? I want to get, leave people with action steps, big time action steps to take to not only get further in touch with you, but also to get the spinal hygiene movement in going before they even graduate, or if they're a chiropractor already, I want them to know how to implement it into their office. So if you have yeah. any action steps, I would love to hear them. 
So, so we have a Facebook page, um, Spinal Hygiene Doctor. If you're a chiropractor or, or a staff, we actually have a private group. If you look up, um, I think it's Spinal Hygiene Doctors Club or something like that. Um, there's a private group and just it's you click on it and I can add you. Um, and and what we're trying to do is build a community and build a movement. And so that's why it's so important. I ask you know chiropractors and their teams to come to these live seminars and help support us. Um, these seminars are at at you know, chiropractic universities and we can make a draw and be able to fill seats and the leaders of our profession and the leaders of our, our uh, colleges can see that we're getting a lot of people behind this movement. Then we can start maybe implementing it into some of the curriculum like it needs to be. So, you know, going back to that poll that I told you where we, we, if we pulled dentist, 99% of them would say, they do dental hygiene and exactly how they do it, right? Well, the reason why they can say that is because they were taught that in school. Yeah. Like everything that a dental hygienist knows and does, a dentist did it when they were in school. Yeah. Right? And so we need that in our chiropractic schools. We need to be teaching what is lifetime spinal care and how does somebody take care of the spine and what is a healthy spine and, you know, teaching that from that standpoint and that concept. And I think if we can start that, then more chiropractors will share it with more patients and we can start to grow um, until we hit that point where it becomes something that's household and people begin to understand that it's important they take care of their spine for a lifetime. Yeah, yeah. We get that 97% and then we get the 50% that actually show up right. to our office, which would be huge we, for chiropractic. We should be at least – like dentist is, dentistry is the second largest healthcare prof profession in the world. That should be us. I, was, I actually believe we should be the largest healthcare profession in the world because people should be coming to us first. Yeah. Um, in all the, you know, for our documentary, we interviewed several different people and testimonials, absolutely amazing uh, results that chiropractic got for these people. Every single person that we interviewed said they wish they would have heard about it sooner. Yeah. Yeah. So why in our healthcare system are we not the go-to? When you look at the opioid crisis, when you look at all these things, it all points to you know, let's get chiropractic first, then medicine second, then surgery last. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There. I mean, we, we are the preventative measure. We are that alternative healthcare. And I think more people, like you're saying, you're right on the nose with it. You're, more people are seeking it today more than ever before, which is awesome for us and awesome because that leads to healthier, happier families, right? I yeah. mean, like it's common sense to us. It's a better way. Yeah, <laughs> so, absolutely. Um, Dr. Tabor, thank you for being on. I want to encourage everyone to head to spinalhygieneatlanta.com. Dr. Tabor will be there. The dates for his seminar are April 26th and 27th. It is only 150 bucks per person to go and attend the uh, Spinal Hygiene Seminar, and you'll learn, I'm sure, a, a ton of information on how to implement it in your office, how to use it with you know at home yourself, and also encourage your patients, if you are a student clinician, how to encourage your patients to start taking action now, which I think is really it'll be, important. It'll be well worth the investment in return of you know, return on that investment back into your office because we'll show you, you know, how to communicate better, how to increase conversions, um, how to increase uh, conversions to wellness and lifetime care, um, and then how to get out into your community and share this message that people want to hear and need to hear. And so then actually in turn increasing more uh, new patient flow into your office as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, before we hop off here, I, I just saw this note that I wrote down. Tell me how uh, Rodeo Houston Rodeo Rodeo Houston yeah. was that. I mean, yeah. I love it. You do it every year, right? How long have you every been doing year. it? A couple years? Yeah, a couple years now. I actually have since I moved to Houston, which was about uh, 10 years. ago. Yeah, 10 years, nine years ago. Um, I've been trying to get on the rodeo uh, or actually it's the sports medicine committee. And uh, I just got on two years ago nice. and it's been awesome. Rodeo Houston is the largest rodeo in the world. And so the contestants, we're, we're in the training room, contestants get to come back, we get to adjust them. Um, and I've been really, really surprised. All those cowboys and cowgirls, like literally 99% of them are get regular chiropractic already. Like yeah. they walk in, they're like, yes, there's a chiropractor. Can I get adjusted? <laughs> like, well, I've, I've, I think I might have had one or two people that have never been adjusted that actually got adjusted there. Most of them are like, yes, I'll do it. Come on. I got to get my, I got to tell my chiropractor I got adjusted at Rodeo Houston, right? That's um, awesome. So it's been, it's been awesome. Um, we get, we're getting, um, you know, a lot of, uh, like, so Rodeo Houston is going to be on like Fox, Fox Sports Southwest, I think. Okay. And, um, 
our committee chairman for the sports medicine committee is a ER doc, a medical doctor, but she, they talk about, you know, chiropractic in a great light that we work, you know, side by side. And then, um, they're always using, doing like flipping the B roll of chiropractors, adjusting the contestants. And so it, we just, we're shining a really good light on chiropractic by being there. Yeah. I love it. It's how many of you are, how many of you work it? Uh, chiropractors. I there's 10, of, 10 chiropractors. There's a lot more in the, in the entire healthcare committee that's there. Okay. Um, but I think ultimately there's 10 chiropractors there. That's a, I mean, that's a pretty good number. I think I, I only see obviously your pictures. Um, well, there's only two there per night and okay. there's 20 nights. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah that's awesome. I, I congratulate you on getting in there and you know, and that's Thanks. the thing too, is we got to get chiropractors in more events like this, big events that it, it means something not only to the chiropractor for being there, cause I'm yeah. sure you enjoy it, but it also mm -hmm. means something for the profession because if there's a positive light shine on chiropractic in yeah. the news, well, that's huge. It, and it's neat because, you know, we're so active in adjusting 20, 30 people every time we're there. And the orthopedic surgeon is sitting there with his hands crossed going, I wish I could help. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, until they have a broken bone or something, which does happen yeah, occasionally, yeah. Um, you know, that they're just not needed. But they get to sit there and watch, you know, positive result after positive result of these uh, these athletes getting off the table. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I think that's I think that's absolutely great. Um, I wanted to bring that up because I jotted down a note. I was like, oh, I got to ask him about this because it's, it's, I think it's great that you're there. And, um, I think it's great working side by side with all those people because that's important for chiropractors yeah. to do. Um, yeah. well, doc, I want to do a shameless plug. Um, everyone head to, uh, the legendarychiropractor.com forward slash mentor up and check out all of the amazing content we have on the legendarychiropractor.com. Also check out all of the mentors that we have on the legendarychiropractor.com. Dr. Tabor is my second to last interview for this Chiropractic Compass podcast for this season. This is the first season of the podcast. It's not going away anytime soon. <laughs> so I'm sure that I would love, to, I know I would love to have Dr. Tabor back and I'm, I would uh, imagine he is honored uh, to, to be here and sharing his spinal hygiene movement with the masses, right? Absolutely. Thank you. Cool. I appreciate you. Me. Thank you, Doc. Have a wonderful night. Say hi to the kids and the wife for me and uh, have a wonderful night. I hope that people go to your event, uh, SpinalHygieneAtlanta.com. Head there now. Buy your tickets. It's cheap and it's fun and you'll learn a lot and you'll get to meet Dr. Tabor Smith. What's cooler than that? <laughs> See you, Thanks, Doc. Brother. Thank appreciate you. It. Yep.